Well, thank you very much, Rick, for that introduction. And good afternoon to everyone listening in. Um, I'm going to be talking about vegetative environmental buffers in regards to air quality. And, and what I'm talking about today is based on experiences here in Iowa, both from a research as well as an extension perspective. Um, keep in mind, as you look at this sort of this watercolored photo on the, the, this front slide, what we're talking about with vegetative environmental buffers are, are tree and shrub based systems. Sometimes in the, in the literature or, or just in conversation, they're known as shelter belts or windbreaks. Uh, occasionally they're called tree buffers. Uh, we call them vegetative environmental buffers here to distinguish them from sort of a technological perspective in that that VEBs, vegetative environmental buffers, are, are an air quality uh, technology. So, so just sort of keep that in mind. Uh, today's presentation is, first I'm going to cover uh, sort of the functional goals of using a VEB talk a little bit about um, VEBs and odor dynamics, how, does, how do odors and trees and shrubs uh, uh, interact. Uh, I'll describe what mitigation means in the context of using this technology, talk a little bit about uh, the economics um, from sort of a producer's perspective of using VEBs, and then talk about VEB maintenance, the things that, that sort of go into the usage of this technology, again, from the, the, the producer's perspective. Before I really get into it, though, I think it's kind of important to give a little more context in terms of where shelter belts or VEBs fit in sort of a hierarchy of, of odor management uh, perspectives. And so there are definitely technologies out there that are designed to help prevent the generation of odorous chemicals um, to begin with. And, and you can think of maybe diet modification uh, as, as one of that, those, those kinds of approaches. The next is to either to, to attempt to capture and destroy um, these odorous chemicals before they're sort of released into the atmosphere, before they're released out of a building or out of a, a pit vent or something along those lines. Technology like biofilters, um, that's a technology that, that our next speaker, Dick Nikolai, has, has researched. And so that's an that's a aspect of, or a, a technological approach to this. Using trees is really sort of a, a tertiary or, you know, you can think of it as sort of the last line of defense in terms of once odors are released into the atmosphere, into the downwind air system, um, these systems are designed to help disperse and dilute um, and, and to reduce to some degree the, the social impact of, of odors. So the goals of vegetative environmental buffers, thinking of the, the farmers that I deal with here in Iowa, um, mostly pork and, and poultry uh, pr producers have come to us for assistance with these systems. But any animal that's produced in a, in, in, a, in a confinement system, certainly VEBs apply. And VEBs have application even in uh, 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 feedlot systems and in fields that uh, manure is being land applied and so on. And I'll touch on those kinds of things as, as I go through. But these are sort of the three main perspectives that, that our producers have when they're thinking about using a VEB. One is for visual screening. Two is to have this vegetative filter where the trees are actually um, doing something to either disperse odors or to help filter odors out of the airstreams. Um, they also like sort of windbreak effects. Uh, generally speaking, they like shade benefits that, that might, might benefit them from uh, reducing heating costs or reducing cooling costs. And then snow management, obviously, is a, is a big deal. Snow fencing, live snow fencing is, is sort of the perspective on that. So I think a good place to start talking about how trees and shrubs can can contribute to reducing odors is is to start talking uh, first a little bit about what odor is and then talk about those dynamics. So so think about this this tree system that we're looking at here in the background when when odors are um, released from buildings such as this. How do trees sort of interact with that? So. First, start talking about that. What is odor? Odor is a is a really interesting thing. <laughs> it's it's a it's an incredibly complex mixing of upwards of over 400 
different chemicals that that combine to create that very familiar manure smell. These chemicals um, come about from the anaerobic decomposition of manure. Collectively, they're known as volatile organic compounds, or VOCs for short. Um, these VOCs, they are ground level emissions. And due to different kinds of weather conditions, temp you know, temperature inversions, due to the fact that most of our agricultural landscapes have few barriers that are creating me mechanical turbulence to, to generate um, mix mixing of air streams and so on, there tends to be limited plume rise. Uh, Odor plumes have different spatial and temporal variability, meaning they, they come in different shapes and sizes. There's actually an air shed uh, that can be defined that's determined by topography, landscape topography and, and building orientation and all these sorts of things. And of course, odors happen throughout the year. Um, and it's this last point, this, this, this note about particulates and odor. This is really key. Um, research has shown that um, the majority of odor that moves downwind and ends up being problematic downwind is, are, are these volatile organic compounds that are moving by way of particulates. These particulate dust particles, they act as a nuclei, they collect these VOCs, and in fact that's how, how most of that travels downwind. And research has shown that to the, degre to, to, the, to the degree that you can control particulate movement, you're also controlling, in, in an important way, in an incremental way, the, the movement of odor as well. So, so keep these things in mind as I, as I talk through this. And I think with these and this a little bit of background here, you get sort of a, an intuitive sense of how, again, that tree barrier in the, in the photo in the background can do something. And so based on research that we've done here as well as looking at research elsewhere, um, VEBs 15 feet plus in, in height, um, there is a dilution effect. And I'm going to talk about each one of these in detail in a moment. There is particulate interception at the, the interface of the trees and, and, and the emissions. There is some deposition of some of the heavier particulates out of the moving airstream due to reduced wind speed. And then the role that aesthetics, the way that a facility looks, the way that a landscape looks can contribute um, social and, and, and psychologically to how people interpret odors. So first, start talking a little bit about, about odors. This is a computer simulation done by some colleagues in Germany. And what it's showing is, is a naturally ventilated swine barn. You can see the direction of the prevailing winds. And this is sort of a, an unabated odor plume. And what you end up getting is you have odor that's, or particulates that are generated in the building and on site. Particulates come from all sorts of places. It comes from feed dust, animal dander, feathers, particulates from the, from the surrounding fields and so on. And some of it's blown through, some of it's generated on site. But long story short, it, it, sometimes it's been portrayed as it rolls along the terrain like that. Sometimes it's been described as sort of a puff kind of a puffing behavior. Um, but the question is, is so what happens if, if you have a barrier here that's inter intercepting this kind, of a, this kind of a stream? Here's a different look at that. Um, again, here's the, uh, a simulation. We have uh, the building here. We've got particulates ventilating out. This is a simulated single uh, row of trees, and obviously there's something different going on here than there is going on here. And this overlay I'm about to show you, there we go, um, kind of this explains some of the dynamics that are going on. This, this overlay is not to scale, but, but again, conceptually I think it can be quite useful. And so when an airstream reaches a row of trees, it does one of three things. Some of it goes around the outside of, of the shelter belts. Some of it goes through this sort of vegetative barrier, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then some of it goes, gets pushed up uh, above uh, this, this tree row. And this pushing up uh, above kind of behavior, um, we can get airstreams that are being pushed one to two times uh, the height, uh, upwards of two times the height of the, the tree row. So if, if you, your tallest row is 30 feet, you're getting some of this airstream and some of the particulates and, and the odors being pushed into the lower airstream, uh, uh, into the lower atmosphere. So you get a little bit of dilution there. Um, where we think the big benefit is, is here to the lee of all of these tree rows. And so what happens when air comes across a row of trees like this is the airstream compresses, it picks up speed, and it 
creates this zone of turbulence just beyond. It's called wind shear. As it comes past the tree, the, the air streams start to expand again, and you get this turbulence. And you can see that, that there's this zone where, where we've got a lot of the particulates just sort of bouncing around in there. And what ends up happening is it allows for a much slower release of these odorous particulates back into the downwind air stream. So again, we're getting a little bit of loss of particulates due to this. We're getting some loss of particulates due to interception here, which I'll talk about next. And then what is actually passed through and beyond, um, again, gets sort of held up and the concentration gets smoothed out a little bit. In terms of physical interception of dust, this is a, a picture of um, a tree outside of a poultry building in Delaware. And um, our research, as well as research that we've pulled out of the literature, shows uh, a number of interesting things. Uh, somewhere around 90% of the odor particles that travel downwind are in the same size range that, that are best captured by trees. Um, not only that, but odor particles tend to be really irregular in shape, and so that allows for a better retention on tree surfaces. It also allows for a better retention of dust on dust, and so you can get a layering of dust. Um, and so it's not just the tree surfaces, um, it's also the, the particulate load that's already on there is serving as a surface for, for more particulates. Um, and it's the, it, you got to keep in mind it's the whole above ground part of a tree that acts as, as surface area for filtration. So if you're using a species that's deciduous and drops its leaves, um, you still have a lot of woody, uh, woody surface area there that is also collecting particulates. Um, so thinking about the seasonality of, of this issue. And, and you're probably looking at that tree in the background and thinking, man, that can't possibly be particularly healthy for that, that plant. Um, and that's true. And so um, to some degree, precipitation can help wash tree surfaces uh, clean if it's a tree that's in an area that's going to be inundated like this one. Um, there are also management perspectives on hosing trees down periodically and, and so on. Um, aesthetics and odor perception. This is a really interesting one um, because it it, it's, a, it's one of the main reasons why a lot of producers want to use it, but it's also the most difficult to measure. Um, however, there have been a few studies out there that have shown that as the, the attractiveness of a farm increases, uh, you know, this is a subjective concept, but as, as, it, as it looks better to the general population, their interpreta interpretation of odors and, and other issues associated with that facility tend to go down. Um, and there has long been uh, this concept in engineering, the notion of out of sight, out of mind, the softening of visual cues. Um, certainly, you know, thinking of a barrier like this, this facility is not going to be visible from, uh, you know, from the roadside and so on. And, and so this is uh, one of the bigger uh, contributions that trees can play in, in, in the role of, of air quality. Just a little bit more on that. Uh, I've uh, uh, participated in focus groups with the general public. In this case, it was, was specifically pork consumers in Iowa, asking them about what they think of, of trees um, in Iowa and in the context of air quality. And, and certainly, there's a high preference for more trees in Iowa's landscape. And I'm, I'm guessing that this is consistent in many different agricultural regions. Um, there is definitely a high agreement that shelter belts or VEBs improve the aesthetics of, of confinement production specifically. And uh, there's also this high appreciation for a visual response to odor issues. So that uh, this, this presumes that, that the public kind of knows why those trees are there, that there's definitely a technological perspective, and that producers are doing something from a stewardship perspective. But again, it's highly visible. A lot of technologies are sort of hidden in the buildings or hidden in the feed or hidden in the, the manure storage. These trees are, are not hidden. They're right out, out in front. So this sort of goes to public education and, and, and communication of, of producers and so on. Um, here's an, a sort of a simulation of what this might look. And so this is a planned facility site. This is one thing that we deal with here in Iowa a lot are retrofit. So I get calls from producers that have a current facility or are interested in putting in trees. And many of them just simply don't 
have the space to put in trees. And so, you know, we do what we can with those, those folks. But with a lot of the new sites, what we try to do is get them to think about planting trees as part of the whole facility site planning and making sure that that system is, that that tree system is accounted for in the, the amount of land that they're allocating to this, the, in the location of buildings and roads and, and so on. So this is just a simple simulation. You know, here's they're putting in a building. This is year one. Um, this is an example species of using red cedar. Um, you might buy a five-year-old tree stock uh, to get sort of a head start on the growth of these trees. Um, by year five, you've got a nice, pretty good stand there. By 15, 20 years, um, depending on where you are in Iowa or in the country, um, or the species that's being there, you've got a pretty nice barrier. And again, this is a big, from, from the producer's perspective, they really appreciate this. Um, just some different views on what this looks like from the ground level. Uh, you're looking at, at, at what's known as an Austree willow, which is a, a sterile hybrid willow so that it doesn't, it doesn't spread, it doesn't, it doesn't act like uh, normal field willows. Um, this is incredibly fast growing. A lot of producers like it because you get that nice sort of wall effect very quickly. Um, so that's a very common tree that, that we use here in Iowa. So what does odor mitigation mean uh, in the context of using a VEB? Um, based on our research, Dick's going to talk a little bit about it more specifically next, um, based on research around the country, VEBs provide incremental benefits in terms of reducing odor. Um, it's not a silver bullet. It's not the only technology that should be applied. Again, remember when I started this, um, trees are a tertiary perspective, that last line of defense kind of thing. And so we always think about using trees as part of a suite of odor management strategies. It's just one of many things that producers can do um, to, to help deal with this issue. And in terms of you know, actual contributions to reducing odor, we tend to think of it in terms of trees helping to reduce the phytofactors, the frequency, intensity, the duration, and the overall offensiveness of odors, and that it, it's beneficial in enhancing the, the, the separation distance between a, a production site and someone downwind. Dick will talk a little more specific about that, about that next. But there are other benefits of, of, of using this from a technological standpoint. One, it's, it's definitely a size neutral technology in that large producers or small producers um, can use trees in various ways. It's also user neutral. And this is sort of an interesting concept in that the public, uh, someone downwind who is being bothered by a, a neighboring facility, they can plant trees too. So it's not just something that applies at the farm level, um, it also applies, uh, you know, in sort of a more landscape perspective and a downwind perspective as well. Um, it's a technology that can help with all sources of odor, so trees can be planted to deal with buildings, to deal with manure storage, to deal to some degree with fields that are receiving manure uh, applications and so on. Um, and in theory, uh, you know, Assuming that the VEB remains healthy, that it's managed well over time, um, there should be an increased effectiveness over time and that the trees are getting larger, more morphologically complex, and so on. Um, and it's also comparatively very inexpensive. And I'll touch on that uh, more specifically in a moment. Um, and it's species neutral. Again, I mentioned that, that largely our experience is with poultry and, and swine production. But again, it, it, it's a multi-species perspective because of the, the commonalities in um, how odor, regardless of, of where it's from, how it moves through a landscape. Planting design issues. This is, this is a big deal. Um, and every site is its own site, and it has its own characteristics. It has its own landscape. It has its own air shed. And so, you know, the, the correct VEB is really a site-specific issue. There are some blueprint generalities that can be applied to this concept, but um, we generally do site visits and really cater our designs um, that we offer to individual individual producers. But, but generally thinking, um, we always take into account the goals of the producer. Are they looking for visual screening? Are they looking for true filtration? Uh, you know, do they want snow management? What do they want? We look for functional zones where we're going to try to enhance um, dilution effects and interception effects. We definitely, 
definitely look for sight lines. You know, where are the roads? Where is this facility visible so that we get uh, appropriate species for visual screening? And then, of course, the big one is create no hazards. You don't want to plant trees that are going to cause snow deposition problems. You don't want to put trees in a, in a place where it's going to cause ventilation problems. Um, in a naturally ventilated system, that's really critical. You've got to have those, that airflow in the summertime. Uh, if you're a mechanically ventilated system, you don't want to have those, those trees too close to the buildings that are being vented because um, it's going to cause back pressure and, and increase your energy bills and, and, and so on. And so, again, create no hazards. You also don't want to put trees where there's gonna, they're going to cause visibility issues on site. You've got a lot of trucks coming in and out and so on. So just very briefly, you know, thinking of functional zones, um, here's a belt that might be appropriate for this kind of a naturally ventilated s system. Um, notice that there are uh, some general rules of thumb here. We've got some distances um, that might be considered minimum distances from the building uh, so that they're not too close and is going to cause a snow deposition area. Of course, you know, depending on the species that you use and so on and the spacing between trees, you can have them at variable distances. But it's important to think about these things from, from an engineering and from a, a, a hazard perspective. Um, you might have different perspectives on spacing. So here's you, if you wanted to have some southern coverage but were concerned about uh, uh, summer ventilation, you might have some very wide spacing. So you still get a little bit of continuity from a visual perspective and a little bit of um, uh, perhaps you know, preventing some of the particulates from moving um, downwind from the facility across, across this area and picking up VOCs and, and so on. You might have that. Um, I forgot to mention here in the corner, these are wind roses. And what these are are basically you know, maps of the prevailing wind. And so if you look at the June and August, this is for central Iowa, what the, the length of these lines and the direction indicate where it's coming from and where most of the wind comes from during these time periods. So from June to August, we get mostly southerly uh, winds we've get coming in from the southeast and a little bit coming in from the southwest. So you know you want to plant trees to a, definitely account for your prevailing wind systems. In the winter time, you know the November through February perspective, the wind rose flips in Iowa, and so most of it's coming from the north um, and, the, and the northwest and the northeast. So again, from a snow perspective, here's that that functional zone, that location area. From a summer standpoint, where you know you you generally do get most of the odor complaints because people are outside enjoying the day and so on, you definitely want to have this functional zone for creating dilution and for interception effects and and those sorts of things as the the wind blows through the buildings, picking up VOCs and, and pushing them on downwind. You can even throw in different kinds of other perspectives. Maybe this is a secondary uh, snow fence. Maybe you're throwing in a different kind of species, like a shrub species. This is, this is like a red osier dogwood that carries a lot of color with it during the summer and, and fall and winter and, and so on. So you can, you can have some sort of landscape architect, uh, architectural perspectives as well, if you wished. Um, now to talk a little bit about economics, the, 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 just like the effectiveness of a VEB, the, the costs are also highly variable and, and definitely site and design specific. But there's always sort of these three main categories. Um, first is the site prep costs. Uh, again, and this is going to be variable, but a lot of these sites, particularly on retrofits, um, these are essentially construction zones, right? And you've got a lot of compacted soils. You've got former roads. You've got areas that have been in sod for a long period of time. Um, and they really need site prep. You just don't plunk a tree in and expect it to grow um, for the long term. So there's always going to be some site prep necessary. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, definitely tree stock and establishment costs. So actually buying the plants, that's usually the biggest cost. And then, and then planting the, the trees um, is also a big cost. And then, of course, there's the long-term maintenance, um, which is absolutely necessary to keep the trees healthy, to keep the site looking good. Um, you know, so we're talking mowing, we're talking pruning, we're talking replacing trees that are unhealthy or, or you know, dead or dying, um, those kinds of things. And, and I'll touch on these in a minute. But from an economic standpoint, you know, so here's that, that demonstration site I just showed. Um, 
three different species, uh, the Austri willow that I had mentioned, red cedar, um, and then this red osier dogwood, which is a, a nice shrub species. Here's the number of trees that might go into this system. Here's the general unit costs of these, of these species, you know, some notes about the kind of um, uh, plant stock that, that's involved here. And so here's what that translates in, in terms of, a, of costs. A lot of farmers want to know what it's going to cost them up front. So I crunched these to give you that perspective. I analyze costs over a, a planning period, say a 20-year period. That's, that's kind of how long some of our ownerships go in Iowa. That's sort of the, the general um, length of time that buildings uh, will be on site before they really need refurbishing. Um, and it's also sort of the length of time for some of these species, Austria willow, for example, has a, a 15 to 20 year lifespan before they start to, to fade a little bit. Um, so that's what the time horizon is. So over a 20 year period, um, I've, I've calculated costs, but the upfront cost $740 to, to put this in, which it represents about 40% of the total 20 year costs. Um, uh, our producers like to hear about these things on an animal basis, and so thinking from a from a pork production perspective, total cost per pig over a 20-year period come to about three cents a pig. Um, think about this in a from a you know capital recovery or an annual cost perspective, about $160 a year over that that 20-year period. If you're in a part of Iowa or part of the country that requires that has dry soils or um, uh, dry climate and, and poorly drained soil, poorly drained soils, rapidly draining soils and those sorts of things. Um, irrigation might be a, a, a side thing that you'd have to throw in. So just, a, just an example of how some of these other issues might play in financially. Um, with extensive drip irrigation, it adds um, not even a penny to the total cost on a per pig basis. Um, Site prep. So this is getting into some of the elaborating a little bit on on these costs and what's involved. Um, proper site prep, and, and you just cannot uh, underemphasize this. Um, you can't overemphasize this. Rather, um, if you do it right, it's going to reduce tree mortality. It's going to increase tree growth, sometimes upwards of seventy percent. But ultimately, it's going to reduce the time, money, and effort that goes into to dealing with these systems. Um, something definitely appealing to to producers. Um, so, you know, proper site prep, again, it's going to vary, but it, it might be as elaborate as a two-year two -year process. The, the year before you plant, you might go in if you're dealing with a sodded area. Um, you have a kill strip, you're using chemicals, you're going to go in with equipment and disc and cultivate the area um, just to break the soil up. The following spring, you might go back in. Uh, and disc and cultivate it again, maybe even rototill it to really get this soil uh, suitable for receiving trees. Um, general rules of thumb and these sorts of things. If you contract it out, most of those folks know exactly what goes into this to, to ensure long-term tree health and so on. But again, this is just to give you a perspective on what could be involved. Um, tree care options, again, here's that drip irrigation example. Um, you know, you've got all you need is a main line uh, of water, a water supply, and you've got the main line to run uh, basically hoses in and around the trees. You can see an example of this. Most of us know drip irrigation um, adds not even a penny, even though it looks like kind of an elaborate system. Uh, so thinking about how costs get spread over time. Um, but again, in, in certain parts of the country, this is going to be ne necessary to keep those trees alive, um, especially once they're established. Once they get a little older, they become more hardy, but uh, most species do anyways. But you always got to think about these things up front. Um, I'm not really going to talk a lot about mulching, but this is, this is merely here to give the perspective that individual trees. I mean, this, this is a whole system management process and that individual trees need individual care. You just don't plunk it in the ground and walk away. Um, mulching comes into play and there are correct ways to do mulching. And again, I, we, we generally, um, most of our farmers here contract all of this out and so they get this kind of advice directly either from the nursery or from the folks that are out in the field planting the trees. Um, but again, it sort of adds the, this, this concept that there's quite a bit going on in terms of management. Um, dealing with weeds is, is a big problem, especially in the early phases of tree development. Um, they can easily outcompete seedlings. So there are chemical approaches. There are um, 
uh, different kinds of biodegradable materials that can go into the ground that trees can be planted into um, that keeps weeds down. Each individual trees can have, you know, different kinds of mats. And so we've got trials as well as colleagues in Delaware that are looking at these kinds of things and looking at the different kinds of cost, potential cost streams associated with, with weed control. So in summary, um, it's, it's important to keep in mind that, that from, from our research, the biophysical as well as the social quantification, VEBs do play a role. It's an incremental role, but, but from that tertiary perspective, um, they can play an important role. And, and more research is on the way, and Dick's going to talk uh, about some of the things that he's got ongoing uh, in this regard. Um, it's a relatively inexpensive technology, but it is definitely an expense. Um, there are cost share programming uh, available in Iowa and other states, but it's very important. Our research shows that a lot of farmers want to do it, but they're, they're reluctant to take that first step unless there's um, some financial incentive up front. So, so it's important to know what cost share programs can fit this, uh, this, this technological use. Um, it is, the, in Iowa anyways, it's the fastest growing application of the use of shelter belts. Now, you know, windbreaks and shelter belts have multiple purposes uh, beyond air quality, and that's, that's their, it's, it's a very old technology. But from an air quality perspective, we're getting, I think that's probably the, that's the growth industry of, of, of using these trees. And so it's really important for those who deal on the tree side to understand animal production and the requirements of that system. On the other side of, of that issue, is that those on the livestock side, I think, need to understand trees, and that that a lot goes into keeping these these uh, to keeping trees alive over the long run. And uh, more information is becoming available from from my university, from Dix, and from others. So always sort of keep your eye out for um, new information that's that's coming out. And here's sort of a final picture. Here's an eight-year-old Austri willow. Those trees are pushing 30 feet, 25 feet, somewhere around there. Um, an Austri willow will grow three to four feet a year, um, starting from the initial planting. So there's a lot of different species out there that, that can, can do a lot of different things for, for producers. And with that, I'm, I will, I'm done.